Okay, so let's begin. So this second part, we want to introduce you to the, the kind of other things that space weather this point, well, actually it's less than the point one, uh, you know, percent of the solar constant. Uh, we're kind of now talking about the possibility that the sun's CMEs, CIRs, the flares, all of these things are now being thrown out by the sun. The total energy, as, as we've been told, is pretty negligible. But yet, uh, from our technological world that we live in, it is the uh, part that uh, is important to us. So the first thing, uh, as we go forward, remember 100 and 120 kilometers. You're going to look at plots and sort of figure out whether or not it's still relevant, OK? So the first part we're going to talk about is the uh, aurora. The um, magnetosphere generates ionization via energetic particles, usually electrons. Now, that, now I use the word usually electrons. Uh, protons uh, can be uh, accelerated. During big storms, uh, molecular uh, ions get accelerated up to very high energies. But these don't necessarily they get trapped in ring uh, currents and uh, radiation belt kind of phenomena. So we're talking about primarily the uh, thing that generates our uh, regular aurora, and it's electrons. These particles are energized in the magnetosphere and create ionization and heating in the thermosphere ionosphere. Auroral displays are the manifestation of this process. How many of you have seen an aurora? OK, one, two, three. Oh, OK, yes, sir. <laughs> I should put my hand up. Uh, but the aurora, uh, the rest of you, in the next few years of your life, find a conference that's up in the auroral zone, honest, and go in the winter, even if it's cold. You know, just give yourself a chance to see this. The other way of seeing it with some degree of uh, you know, prob high probability is in an airplane. Uh, going from, let's say, the west coast all the way to Europe, or from our east coast into Asia. Uh, these polar uh, flights, uh, unless this, the storm is severe, the geomagnetic storm is severe, will pass through the auroral zone. And if you're sitting on the correct side of the airplane, you'll get to see, you know, just brilliant aurora. OK, that's my sales pitch. Go north, OK? Uh, the, uh, the ionospheric conductive is a dynamic resistor in the MI electrodynamic MHD system. And all of these models depend on that. So here is ionization rates. So we're familiar with the photon ionization rates. And what you're looking at is altitude uh, versus ionization rates. Now, there's six different curves on here and uh, six different aurora electron populations. Now, for this computation, this is a computation. And instead of photons at a certain wavelength, what we've got are uh, uni uh, unidirectional monoenergetic electron fluxes. Now, that doesn't actually exist. Uh, there aren't beams quite that perfect. But nonetheless, uh, they do uh, represent the kinds of electrons that come in. This, too, represents 2 kilovolt electrons coming straight down. At high latitudes, magnetic field lines aren't vertical, but they're close to vertical, 5, 10, 20, 40, 100. And of course, right away, you know, uh, if you look at energies between 3 and 8, or f between 2 and 10, uh, we're back to this same altitude region. And it turns out, now you might argue it's fortuitous, and it's just lucky, and it might not be the same anywhere else. And that's why when you're doing uh, magnetospheres and other planets, uh, what kind of energization goes on? What does the characteristic energies of these populations look like is so important. But for our terrestrial uh, purposes, although 100 keV electrons do exist and do come down, and much colder ones uh, do come down, the dominant uh, ones that create the auroral emissions and the majority of the ionization are uh, uh, electrons in this kind of range. Now, that might just be fortuitous, but there it is. It's back into this uh, actual similar region. And of course, that means that not only are our uh, kind of solar flares, we'll come to that in a second, and these electrons uh, kind of generate an ionization here in what we call the E region. The E region is where the majority of the Hall and Pedersen conductivity are. 
Now, if you're a simple uh, magnetospheric modeler and you just need a resistor to close currents, you could represent this as just a thin uh, resistor and actually from the Pedersen conductivity calculate an effective resistance and that's your ionosphere. And it's an oversimplification, but that was how we used to uh, handle the ionosphere in magnetospheric models. This band in here, whether it's aurora or sunlight, is where the resistor is, okay? Uh, at what altitudes do the three, to, so this is one more time just to make sure you're getting the message, okay? Uh, here then is what, uh, it, it again is stolen from another source. Uh, over here you have the electron density profile, but the idea is uh, we have an altitude uh, regime. Uh, we have things like the E region down here somewhere in our 100 to 120. You could argue some of these peak a little higher. Uh, I'm not going to argue with you. Uh, that's true depending on the specifics. But somewhere down in here, uh, on the day side, there's the hall, and then here's the Pedersen conductivity. These uh, conductivities are the effective resistor which enables magnetospheric uh, energy that's been collected from uh, the sun. What fraction of the solar energy did Dana tell you kind of does the magnetosphere collect? What, what percentage, roughly? Does anybody remember? Is it 100%? Come on. Pardon? No, no, no. It was a, a significantly larger percentage, yeah? That is 10 to 20 was the number Dana gave. And, and that's not un OK. For, was it Fran as much? But th that's about the solar wind is streaming past with uh, a boatload of energy. And the magnetosphere is able to collect between 10 and 20% uh, of that energy. And that energy, some part, fraction of it, depending on how this uh, huge, di uh, what we, we can either call it a voltage uh, source or a current source. And there could still be arguments as to how to describe it. But the ways in which that energy through current flows uh, dumps energy in different places depends on the, the resistive loads in different places. And of course, it's quite complicated. But the ionosphere does contribute in this altitude region uh, conductivity. At high latitudes, the magnetic field lines are the wires, if you like, to the magnetosphere. And of course, all these current systems uh, the Chapman Ferraro and other current systems that you may have come across, uh, they do look for where is the least resistance path. And that's why lots of the currents flow into the auroral zone. The auroral ionization enhances this, and the dual heating uh, then generates uh, energy deposition. OK, uh, the electric field is the next piece of this uh, problem. In the F region, the electric fields can induce plasma drifts to raise and lower the F layer. So this first, this other region that we haven't spent too much time on, which is O plus uh, ions and electrons, uh, dynamically the E cross B for field lines that aren't purely vertical but are tilted as you get away from the pole, uh, the plasma can be moved up and down. This modifies the plasma diffusion balance and hence density and profile shape. So when people talk about uh, the ionosphere affecting GPS, this is one of the main ways in which uh, the total electron content gets redistributed, if you like, along a field line. But then uh, dual heating, which is a, a Pedersen conductivity times E squared, to be kind of naive, uh, does depend on where the, the Pedersen conductivity uh, exists. And of course, you now know where that is, whether it's sunlight or auroral electrons. It's down below 150, maybe above uh, 100 kilometers in that regime. Uh, so at what altitudes would dual heating be maximized? So again, uh, everything is dumping the energy in at that altitude. OK, so this, this figure. Um, in uh, a kind of ionospheric physics becomes kind of important. There's, there are winds. Uh, we haven't talked about the atmospheric winds, but as you probably expect, the atmosphere isn't a static uh, 
kind of body of air. It's kind of dynamic. There are large scale tides in the atmosphere. There's smaller scale gravity, gravity waves. Uh, so the geometry we're looking at here is a northern hemisphere it, at mid to high latitudes. The magnetic field line points down into the Earth. And uh, this would be a wind blowing from the high latitudes uh, towards the equator, if you like. And uh, the, the result is you're going to feel the line drift. The plasma, uh, down here, there's collisions between uh, the, the, the neutrals and our plasma ions, trying to force them to move. Uh, and of course, the, the motion effectively results in a vertical uh, mo movement that goes into our equations uh, to solve where the plasma is going to uh, move to. And if it's an electric field, in the same sense, this electric field, which direction is our electric field pointing relative to us? Out to us, yeah? And if you do E cross B, you would have a, 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 an expectation that the plasma drifts like this. But in actual fact, there's a, just a, a kind of vertical lifting, if you like. So I do have one question to make sure we're on the same physics. What process is our, ch our charged particles obeying that prevents them following the wind or the electric field. So this is kind of an important part. What's, what's preventing the uh, particles just moving across field lines, whether the wind is pushing them or the uh, electric E cross B? What, what's, what are the electrons and the ions doing on these magnetic fields? Gyrating, yeah? So if it's not collision dominated and they're able to exercise uh, many uh, kind of gyrations, uh, the, they don't uh, move across the field lines uh, in that sense. They have a very strong vertical component which goes into the diffusion equation. And this is how winds and electric fields move uh, plasma up and down, not necessarily to other places. And the winds never do move them to other places. But this, now what happens as you go deeper, deeper down into the atmosphere? Collisions start to dominate. And then, then, of course, you start to break down. Now, do the collisions, are the collisions the same for the electrons and the ions? No. So that as you kind of come down in altitude, the electrons uh, are kind of uh, less collisional than the ions. And what happens is you start getting charge separation places where the electrons are still gyrating quite happily and, and locked. Uh, and this is our atmospheric dynamo, uh, wind-driven dynamo uh, system. OK. OK, so what we want to talk about now is what do these winds uh, lead to? Uh, in what ways do they mess up our nice laminar um, uh, ionosphere, where there's an E layer and an F layer, and, and everything's kind of nice? OK, we're going to the equator. And this, this plot is a little complicated, but uh, we're looking at when it's zero, that's zero altitude. And this is supposed to be the Earth's surface. And it's kind of drawn as if it was curved. Uh, how many of you are flat Earth people? You've, you, you know such people still exist? OK, uh, so this one's curved. And uh, at different altitudes, we've got these curved lines. So that's straightforward. And uh, the radial lines uh, just represent uh, perpendicular uh, to this curved surface. So that's your vertical. Over here is your altitude scale. Here's your uh, lower uh, uh, ionosphere. So that in this case, the E region isn't included. The E region is extremely important to creating the electric field that's creating this. But we're not going to talk about that. But what you've got is a motion uh, of uh, the plasma in this. It's not collision dominated, uh, where the drifts lead to the plasma at the equator, uh, this is in sunlight, being kind of driven upwards. And then as it goes to uh, higher altitudes, the, the latitudinal, uh, this is latitude 3 degrees, 6 degrees, 9 degrees from the equator. Uh, what you're seeing is the orientation of the drift is uh, changing. And eventually, it comes back down. So this could be, uh, it's referred here as the flux magnitude. So it's the flux, if you like, uh, of the uh, ion uh, as they're being drifted across. So this phenomena leads to the following. 
Okay, so now it will take a second to make sure we're on the same page. Zero on this axis represents the uh, dip equator. So the plot we had before was vertical up through here and going this way. So this now has both uh, the northern and the southern uh, hemisphere. And what you're looking at on this scale, on the contours, is the density of the F region, this higher altitude region, on a log scale. So uh, a 6 represents 10 to the power 6 per centimeter cubed. And uh, the ionosphere that, that you've kind of seen before with the nose and the chin and everything would be a constant altitude. But here, this uh, constant altitude uh, is lifted up, goes up and over, and in this example that we're looking at, the peak at the equator is no longer at 300 kilometers. It's way up at uh, six, 700 kilometers. So this geometry, uh, if you like, of where the plasma is distributed does, even if you're simply thinking of GPS, putting the layer in the wrong place gives you a big error in GPS. Uh, a lot of the early GPS analysis schemes used a thing called the Klobuchar ionosphere, which is a very simple uh, ionosphere. And it didn't, it didn't reproduce this kind of structure very well. It was more keeping the ionosphere at a fixed height. And then from a GPS point of view, your, your geolocation information for this purpose could be out by many kilometers, uh, as an example. So um, then let's go back up to high latitudes now and ask what do uh, the electric fields do to you up there? Well, uh, what we've got on this is a polar plot, 70 degrees latitude. This circle would be 80 degrees, but it's kind of complicated. We've combined two different things. We've mapped the magnetospheric electric field into the ionosphere and presented it as a potential distribution. So these lines, if you like, are uh, equipotentials. Uh, it's called a two-cell pattern, and maybe you can see why it's called a two-cell pattern. But this is 70 degrees magnetic latitude. The magnetic pole is in the center. Now, the nomenclature that we use is we, put, we cast this in magnetic coordinates. So this is 12, and it's 12 noon in a magnetic frame, 1800 midnight and 0600. Does anybody know why the magnetic coordinates, magnetic local time, and uh, solar local time aren't the same? No, no, no. Yes, who said yes? Go ahead. Uh-huh, different. They're spun apart. The, the, the difference in terms of uh, c computation might be up to an hour difference in what you'd call the local solar time at a point versus its magnetic uh, time. But that's all because the Earth's dipole axis is offset in the northern hemisphere by how much? No, no, that, no that's, that's too large. 11. Uh, but in the southern hemisphere, how much is it offset by? Fifteen or sixteen. Is the Earth's uh, dipole field or magnetic field truly a dipole field? No. Uh, the, the words, uh, the higher order moments are already there. Uh, so it's not perfect. The northern hemisphere turns out to be easier to work with. In the southern hemisphere, the difference between what you would call the, uh, the uh, okay, at the equator and at the pole, what's the difference in magnetic field strength at a given height? If you have a pure dipole, what would you expect the B field to be at the pole? Yeah. There's a couple of us doing this to each other. Uh, that's uh, not just a victory sign. It's the fact that uh, from a dipole at the pole, you're factor two larger magnetic field strength. And then, of course, that would then occur at a place where the B field should be perpendicular. In the southern hemisphere, these two locations where you maximize the B field magnitude and it's perpendicular to the Earth's surface are not co-located. So the, the Earth's magnetic field isn't the dipole we think it is. OK. Um, oh, sorry, we're not finished. I got carried away there. Oh. So they, th this is two satellite passes, uh, orbits, from a satellite called Dynamics Explorer 2. It measures the plasma flow. So the E cross B 
uh, in the F region or the upper uh, ionosphere. And, and you can see there's little uh, black lines. This represents the flow. Basically, uh, across the polar cap, here's noon, so the sun's up here. It's called anti-sunward flow. And again, here you're seeing it. And then uh, on the flanks, if you like, on the other side, that's flowing towards the sun. And basically, these flows are following the equipotentials. So uh, in the ionosphere, uh, they're, they're, it's a fairly straightforward, the, the uh, equipotential you know, lines that we've drawn here do represent reasonably well uh, the direction in which the plasma E cross B will carry you. Now, it's a model versus data. So the, the uh, authors have juggled things around. And although it looks pretty good, uh, you can see places where it doesn't quite match. And that's one of our big problems. Uh, we talk about dual heating. We talk about auroral precipitation. These all have to be aligned correctly. If you put your conductivities in the wrong place for a large electric field, you don't get large dual heating. And one of the big problems in MI coupling, magnetosphere ionosphere coupling, is exactly what's the fine structure uh, in these fields, the auroral distribution and the electric field distributions. Uh, we're still a ways away from getting that. From two satellite passes, it's a lucky day when you can generate the full uh, convection or the full electric field pattern. It doesn't normally happen. OK, uh, the electric field uh, does, of course, uh, one more thing. Uh, when you have this dual heating, the heat goes somewhere. And of course, it goes to heat up the electrons. And the point I made earlier was that um, these reaction rates are all very temperature dependent. So here's a great example. Uh, this is uh, the two plots are meant for the same location, for the same conditions, except uh, in this case, we've put a 100 millivolt per meter electric field. Now, that's a, a large electric field. 30 millivolts per meter would be very good disturbed times, but there are cases of 100. Uh, if I put 100 into this atmosphere, uh, ionosphere combination, you can see the O plus is the nose again, and the molecular ions are lower down, uh, forming uh, a kind of region uh, that's the E layer. Now, this uh, entire O plus, when you start to increase the temperature uh, during these dual heating events, converts O plus into NO plus. Uh, and the NO plus recombines much more quickly uh, than O plus. So what happens is during the heat, when you're heating uh, the kind of map of uh, the different chemical reactions, this one from here to here, and then, of course, this diminishes much more quickly. So you come down here, and you see o, o plus, this is this curve here, compared to up here, under identical solar illumination and everything else. All of a sudden, that its peak has gone away, and uh, there's an enhanced nitric oxide ion. And the, the kind of shape, if you like, now has a peak low down uh, rather than high up. So the chemistry leads to changes. And of course, this, again, going back to our GPS geolocation, messes up any algorithm that assumes the height is at this height, whereas in actual fact it's down here now. So even an application perspective, it uh, has an effect. OK, morphology of the global ionosphere is a systems level problem. Many physics processes operate together as a system, but in different latitude regions. Historically, studies attempted to understand these processes individually and then to assimilate their net effects. And this has never turned out to be very good. The uh, nonlinearness uh, in some of the chemical uh, reaction rates and whatnot prevent you from simply bringing uh, different uh, mechanisms together in a linear sense. So approach is a not, not a linear superposition problem. So the old literature pretty much kind of understood what the individual processes were doing and how they worked. But they, uh, from an early time, realized none of this was very uh, linear. So uh, modern day work has to be these complicated uh, large scale magnetosphere, ionosphere, atmosphere coupled models. And of course, the resolution goes down initially because we don't have the data 
to initialize things properly. Okay, so this is what a modern day computer code might try to handle. Here's all of our processes, and here's some that we didn't even talk about. Meteors, uh, very energetic particles. We kind of just skipped over them. But all of this uh, belongs together. And of course, we didn't say anything about this, what's coming up from below. OK, this is what you get. And it's the most nice picture I've got for you. And it's the kind of hardest part of what we were trying to get to. Uh, this is the sun. Right, and this is a, a, a respectable representation. It's got little wiggles on the side and everything, right? You can tell I'm an honest freight guy. Okay, but but you're getting here. Here's all the good stuff. Uh, how many of you have not seen this figure before? Okay, you should just you know flick through the book. Uh, this appears two or three times in the different uh, versions of our heliophysics summer school. It's not that this. I mean, none of this can ever coexist quite like this, OK? It's an author who's written down all the possible processes and then tried to graphically give you an idea of where it's about. Uh, to be honest, uh, I'm not going to say any more about it. It just looks good, and it looks complicated. So I think the message there is here, the atmosphere really is complicated too. OK, so let's just step back. and see if some of the complication makes kind of sense. The time constants are, are really important, how rapidly things happen. Uh, in the lower region, the E region where the Pedersen and all that are, that time constant is seconds. But as you go higher up, you can transport plasma into the night side and wonder how did that get there. Uh, so this uh, is some early day work. So what we've done here is, and even, uh, an even simple E cross B is uh, complex. So that's this two-cell idea. You have in the magnetosphere uh, a cross-stale potential uh, that maps along field lines, which are kind of infinitely good conductors, down into the uh, upper atmosphere where the resistor is, if you like. And what you end up with here uh, is the E cross B motion. Well, if there was only the uh, E cross B associated with the magnetosphere, it would be these simple two cell patterns. But that's not true. The plasma also corrotates. There's a, 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 a global requirement that the ionosphere also corrotates, which you could then regard as a superposition of two electric fields, a corrotational one. And, and the immediate consequence of that is the plasma far away from the polar regions, number one, circulates in one day. And that's the word corrotation. But as you start to go to higher latitudes, things kind of are different. At the pole, uh, we look at our two cell on the dawn side here, uh, number eight. It goes around in 0.11 uh, of a day. So it's just circulating around. So that's fairly straightforward. And that's true for many of these uh, who are primarily influenced by the magnetosphere. But coming over here, uh, there's now a conflict between uh, what you'd call the corrotation electric field and uh, this cell here that's trying to drive the plasma in the very opposite direction. Here you get a very uh, low velocity region for the plasma. In fact, the words like stagnation uh, is used to describe an environment where plasma that could be in darkness or could be in sunlight isn't moving. And it could have very high densities or very low densities. And these are referred to as troughs in the ionosphere. And again, our GPS world doesn't like these, because suddenly your model that you're thinking describes how GPS corrections need to be made aren't consistent. So over here, number two takes a little longer, because it's been influenced a little bit. But look at number three, and then number four. Number three, the plasma is oscillating around really fast. But number four, it takes 1.34 days to complete one of these uh, circuits. OK, now, what's the big deal? OK, uh, next figure. Oh, please, who's the oh. Yes? Sorry. I Oh, where's the dual heating? OK, uh, the dual heating, ah, my next plot might help a little bit better, OK? So OK, so we're going to ask, where's the dual heating? 
uh, where's the aurora precipitation, where's the sunlight, okay? So let's try to reconstruct that from uh, this figure, okay? Uh, this figure looks more messy, but let's just take uh, this over here. I've drawn three terminators for uh, a winter, equinox, summer. So this is the same polar region, but because of our seasons, uh, the polar cap can be um, either sunlit or dark, and of course that makes a big difference. If we're in the equinox for this polar cap that we've got here, as this uh, little trajectory is going around relatively rapidly, uh, it goes in and out of sunlight. So the same um, uh, magnetospherically controlled convection uh, on uh, this day goes through times when it's sunlit and times when it's dark. Now, coming back to your dual heating. Okay, across the polar cap, this region that was generating that, this motion, the electric fields could be large. Uh, they could be tens to, to 20, 30 millivolts per meter. So you should get dual heating. But the question is, where is the aurora? Well, the aurora isn't in the middle of the polar cap. The auroral oval is somewhat more equatorward. So again, there's another uh, region that we haven't drawn on this, which would represent where the dual, where the uh, Pedersen conductivities are being increased by the aurora, and that would be uh, then a higher likelihood to find the, the heating in these regions relative to the rather, rather than the polar cap. Worse than that, if you're in winter, this entire region's in darkness. And therefore, the E region is pretty weak. And therefore, the conductivities are pretty small. So the combination, in summer, you've got lots of sunlight, lots of uh, Pedersen, sunlit Pedersen. So there would be more dual heating in a more broad sense across the polar cap. But uh, in general, your question is, you have to co correlate where the terminator is, what's sunlit and what's not. Then you have to bring in where did the aurora actually uh, cause its ionization to enhance the Pedersen. And then you have to self-consistently bring in the electric fields. Now, I've talked as if the aurora and the electric fields are two separate things, but they aren't. The aurora precipitation represents upward electrical currents from the magnetosphere. So the entire, where do you align large electric fields with uh, precipitation? is an MHD problem uh, in some sense, that these aren't arbitrarily superimposed upon each other. So that I haven't got a good answer to your question. Yeah, you have to create uh, a, a good correlation between where your electric fields are large, where the aurora's going in, and then what season are you dealing with? Yeah. OK, uh, this is my one magnetospheric kind of piece of information just to put a context to it. The magnetosphere for big storms uh, does dump uh, gigawatts. Uh, it's got a lot of energy. And uh, how is that energy getting to the ionosphere? We've said there's aurora precipitation, uh, but then uh, there's aurora precipitation, which takes about 20% of this kind of energy uh, into heating, uh, ionizing, air glow, auroral emissions. So this energy, 20% of the magnetospheric energy appears as the aurora. But then the electromagnetic energy, uh, we have the other 80%. And the dominant channel is the dual heating channel, which is more than 80%. And, and most of us, when we talk about this, we talk about dual heating as the, the, dry, the dominant one. Uh, there is, of course, a, a kinetic energy issue, too, that the uh, motions uh, of the, the momentum, if you like, uh, causing iron drag. It's also a real thing in the reference frame of the neutral wind. But this is where the bulk of the energy, the dual heating calculation, is the exchange mechanism from these uh, gigawatts uh, that we have during a geomagnetic storm. OK, so at the back of your mind, the, the aurora not only creates the ionization, but it does bring in. Uh, about 20% of the magnetospheric energy that's going to be deposited in the upper atmosphere. That energy, what does it do to the thermosphere? Okay, uh, this is an ugly plot, and uh, Tim, Tim Fularal, whose plot it is, always gets upset with me for showing it. He says, I can do better. Okay, it, it, so what you're looking at are, are quiet, and then 
a disturbed scenario. So what he's done is he's taken that dual heating term and looked to see what are the consequences for the exospheric temperature. That's this neutral uh, temperature in the upper atmosphere. So under the quiet condition, the, the square plot represents uh, all uh, the, our local times. This is the sun, uh, 9 o'clock uh, over, uh, no, it's not 9 o'clock. Uh, it's, I guess it's 19, 22, 1. Two. These are local times. Uh, I believe that. Oh, okay, maybe I do. This is uh, 16, 13 to 16. So this is uh, noon to afternoon, uh, and you can see the, the warmest temperatures. We're using this scale here. The dark blue is about 1,000, 1,500 is a green, and 2,000 Kelvin is a red, which we don't have on this plot. So here's the daytime uh, warmer, nighttime, the middle of the night, uh, low temperatures. And this axis is a, uh, is a latitude plot from uh, s the southern uh, geographic pole through the equator to the northern one. And since there's warmer temperatures up here, what season do you think this might be if uh, the northern hemisphere has a kind of warmer thermosphere? You've got 12 months to choose. Which month do you want to choose? January, February, March, April, May, June. Okay, we've got a, a, a go. Yeah, it's a summertime uh, for the northern hemisphere, the warmer temperatures up here. Okay, we then turn on the storm. And uh, the storm is a larger storm. But what you're now seeing is this entire high latitude is heated up. And this would represent in a geographic coordinate system for the rural oval is. In the middle of the polar cap, there, there's not so much heating. And coming back to your question about where is the heating going on, where's dual heating going? Well, you can see it's a very broad region uh, in uh, the, the high latitudes, but not in the middle of the polar cap. So that's a consistency. And of course, you would expect, even in a dark hemisphere, uh, there should be an aurora, and, and that's what you see down here. There's an aurora in a polar region. But it's not got the same amount of dual heating because the, the enhanced conductivities occur up here, and they aren't down here. So there's more energy deposited in one hemisphere than the other. Now, remember, this is a neutral gas, or exospheric temperature. So this then talks about uh, the, the uh, density distribution of the neutrals in which our ionization processes are all occurring. So it's a good uh, contrast. So then you say, well, but we know what happened here. This is equatorial regions. Why is that warmed up? It's gone up at least 500 uh, Kelvin. So it's quite a significant amount of energy now appears at low latitudes. So what's happened there? Well, the uh, energy deposition with electric fields are all up here. The aurora is all up here. So the magnetosphere brings its energy in into the auroral high latitudes. How did this all happen? We, yeah. Right. So when we say we've heated up these regions, if you have a gas uh, in your house and you've got a heater at one point, what do you expect to happen to that heat? in the rest of your house you'd like to have happen. It all goes to the ceiling, right? So it's not much good, right? But this idea of uh, energy redistribution uh, over hours, it takes a little bit of time, but it does. That uh, magnetospheric energy does find its way into the thermosphere, uh, upper atmosphere, lower latitudes. OK. This uh, now is another complicated uh, picture. But it talks about the different processes that are going on. This is the day of January in 2005. And it, we're going to talk about one storm particularly. So basically, uh, with uh, models and different uh, instruments, you can calculate different parameters. So uh, up here, we've got neutral density and uh, at a particular altitude. How many of you have heard of the CHAMP satellite? Up here, the blue and the black. How many have heard of this German? Uh, yeah, a few of you. Basically, it's got a very uh, sensitive accelerometers on board. 
And as it hits uh, and gets different amount of drag as it goes through the upper atmosphere, during a storm, the atmosphere high up in the uh, low Earth orbit region increases. And then uh, the accelerometer sees this uh, deacceleration, I guess is what you'd call it. So this, so there's data up here of how uh, the neutral density is changing. Uh, then we have uh, ways in which uh, we can calculate how much energy is coming in. Uh, this is hemispherical power. And this one is for the auroral particles. So you measure as you're flying through what kind of auroral particles are coming down and integrate them up. So you get a, a, a plot like this. Then uh, you can do dual heating too, because with other instrumentation, you can measure electric fields. And uh, given that you know something about the particle precipitation and whatnot, you can start putting that together. And then you have a northern hemisphere and a southern hemisphere. Uh, and then uh, you have the kinetic energy, which is this kind of momentum uh, transfer between uh, the neutrals and the ions. And then uh, finally, to balance all of this energy going in, uh, they're looking here at NO nitric oxide cooling. Nitric oxide, like CO2, is a good radiator of energy. And during the aurora, nitric oxide is being produced. And so as much as energy is flowing in, enhanced amounts of heat, if you like, are leaving the upper atmosphere through these channels. So what you have here is, um, let's just put this next. This is the purpose in the, in the uh, article, the purpose of the plot. Here you have a geomagnetic storm, quite a significant one. And everything we talked about, about the system level interaction between these different processes that are going on, you can pretty much validate. The trouble is our magnetosphere ionosphere system isn't good enough yet to predict this. And of course, that means our ability to do the solar wind and the sun isn't good enough to predict the CMEs. But all of this has a, a big impact on, and I keep on using the word GPS because we're most familiar with it, but uh, our real world is then suddenly put at risk with this. How many of you heard the WAAS system, W-A-A-S for GPS? Uh, well, Nick has, okay, and a couple others. Basically, the original GPS, which is a one of frequency, was never very accurate. If you put that in your car and then shut your eyes and let your car drive itself into the garage, you could miss the garage door by meters, which isn't good. So then we have two frequencies, and the, with two frequencies, L1 and L2, with some standard corrections, you can get that down to uh, better than a meter, except during big storms. So uh, the, uh, the government, the FAA in the United States, wanted to bring airplanes closer together as they flew across the country. So they wanted to in develop a system called the Wide Area Augmentation System so that you could do better with GPS with two frequencies. So airplanes had GPS, but they couldn't trust the accuracy. So uh, they developed this system where on the ground they would try to make over the United States uh, good correction maps by looking at GPS, beam it up to a geosync satellite, and then all airplanes and other users could get the better corrections. And when they first brought this system out, it worked great, except it was in the uh, 2000 to 2010 period where there were some, well, maybe a little earlier, some really big storms. And over the United States, where the aurora isn't particularly prevalent, all of a sudden, this WAS system was failing. And you had all these airplanes being told uh, it's, the WAS system's gone offline because it can't meet a 50 meter accuracy requirement. Now, 50 meters, even you and I know that's large, but it's not kilometers. But nonetheless, a storm like this in uh, 2005 would take out this entire system for hours uh, until the storm subsided and the ionosphere became uh, more homogeneous. Not exactly homogeneous, but this creates all kinds of density structures in the ionosphere. OK, we're almost there. Uh, this is this thing that caused the problem. Uh, this is a kind of, oh, total electron content. How many of you know that are familiar with TEC? Total electron content, oh, OK. So, sorry, we should have learned about this earlier on. Okay, I'll make sure this afternoon you get a dose of TEC. 
Okay, it's good for you. Okay. Okay, so here we are, a quiet day. Uh, okay, you all recognize the black line, right? Who doesn't recognize the black line? Dana? Uh, Nick, okay, fair enough. Okay, so this is the Car Caribbean, and uh, there's a thing called the Bermuda Triangle. Okay, how many of you heard of that? Okay, good, so you're, you're literate in some sense. It sits over here. The weirdest of things, uh, when these big wasp problems occurred, they would occur, the idea of augmentation system, in the kind of late afternoon uh, in the American sector. And uh, when they went to study what, what was causing the problem, they discovered from the Caribbean like this, streaming across the United States, which should just be a homogeneous kind of plasma, this TEC, which is just adding up the total electrons in a vertical line through the ionosphere, uh, is basically a map of the, uh, uh, what we'd call it, uh, refractive index of the ionosphere with respect to GPS. If it's homogeneous, it doesn't matter how large or small it is. If it's homogeneous, GPS works, your triangulation. But the minute this happened, you get these long tongue-like structures into the uh, mid-latitudes. And they always kind of seem to come from Florida or down here and stream across. No, it's nothing to do with this region in the Caribbean, I don't think. But today, we don't have a good explanation of what electric field or what's going on under these very large storm conditions that generates these huge gradients. You can see that you're going from blue values down here uh, under 20 tech units to in here over 120. And even if you don't know what the number exactly means, it does imply a strong gradient. And this is what was shutting down the WASP system. And it's still an outstanding problem as to what is the source of these. And of course, all of us have our own ideas, and I won't say anything other than it's still a, a real significant mystery for geomagnetic storm times. OK. Um, can you list important properties of the Earth's ionosphere between 100 and 120 kilometers? If you can't, I've failed completely. OK, let's, let's just ask you. It, it, OK, so what we're about to do is just give you what SAIR is. It's the Sun-Atmosphere Interaction Region. Another version is uh, the space-atmosphere interaction region. In our literature, it's become uh, synonymous, which, whichever one you want, depending on what you're doing. But there's a third version that we'll talk about later, uh, which is star-atmosphere interaction region. So as we talk about exoplanets and exoworlds, everything you've heard today uh, and during the week, um, we have knowledge that's very relevant to uh, exoplanet work that uh, we can come up with scenarios for different star types, what the emissions are, whether it's like Greg talked about, the only thing that's important is the kind of solar constant and it doesn't change, versus uh, space weather, which has nothing to do with the solar constant. It's this uh, wiggle at the end of the 0.1%, which generates for a technological in a world like ours, uh, you know, uh, all of its problems. So that's what the SAIR is, uh, and it's sitting in this 100 to 120 kilometer region. I mean, I use that as a black and white. It's not that black and white. It could be a little bit higher, a little bit lower. In fact, the, the challenge is what kind of aurora or what kind of magnetosphere could change, let's say, the 8 kilovolt electrons to 20? such that the predominant energy was dumped into 20 kilovolt electrons. If you could do that, the SAIR would drop another uh, five or six uh, kilometers. So you could actually do changes. But our system seems to put the uh, Pedersen conductor from the aurora, from uh, storm time uh, lime and, um, X-ray flares, all at the same place. And dual heating depends on that, too. So that the three major energy sources during space weather all lie at the same place. So, OK, and there is lots more. And if you're up for it, come back in about an hour and a half, and we'll go again. But this time, Alan, you're from Scotland, right? No, who's, no where's Alan? Oh, sorry. I, I, sorry, I, yeah, you're not from Scotland then. No. Where are you from? 
Where's that? <laughs> okay, Alan, I've got a treat for you this afternoon. I'll let you mull over it and think about it. Okay, uh, I've done my bit. It's, it's 12. So, uh, any questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Ah, okay. No, no. Okay, so she's brought up a point which is totally correct. Uh, there are times, especially at night, when the E-region's gone away and you, you have an electric field from the magnetosphere, but there is no uh, auroral conductivities. You know, there's n no uh, conductivity created by aurora. So in the polar cap, uh, you've got an electric field and the residual uh, ionization in the ionosphere is up in the F region. So you would have the Pedersen conductivity, although it's much, much uh, smaller, uh, it would still be uh, at these higher heights. So the, the, the point is completely correct, what you're saying. That's the condition under which it would be a higher altitude. Now, if you're in the cusp, okay, where's the cusp? Right, and it kind of comes in. Uh -huh. So the, the, uh, the aurora, we don't normally refer to it as aurora, we call it cusp precipitation. The energy of that is only a couple hundred electron volts. So a couple hundred electron volts don't get all the way down to the E region. They're up in the F region. So there's another example where the Pedersen conductivity is enhanced very high up in the F region and the dual heating. In that cusp region, you can't get large electric fields you would get uh, heating. And we didn't talk about this word like polar wind and plasma outflow. So these are, you know, these places where you would get that, yeah. Yes? Yes? Okay, so Tim, uh, Tim Fullerell uh, complains, I keep on coming back to this plot. It was made a long time ago, and the model might not be as good as his modern day uh, versions. So I wouldn't put too much um, emphasis on the structure you're looking at. I I'm not going to try to convince you that that structure is meaningful in the way we want it to be. What we were showing there primarily was the difference between the energy deposition in the northern hemisphere, which is in sunlight as well as aurora, versus the southern hemisphere. Yeah. So the, the structure, no, I, I would discourage you putting too much faith in that. Yeah. Oh, only <laughs> That's my, that's my second view graph this afternoon. Yeah, so I, I've kind of got into the exo world. I mean, escape from reality is good. <laughs> Too much GPS, as you gather. I mean, uh, I've spent the last few years working with a team in Utah that delivers to the uh, Air Force Weather Agency a model, which is an assimilation model, which takes measurements of the ionosphere and tries to create an assimilation model of the ionospheric densities and things that you see. And that's a real hard job when you look at real data and the modeling deficiencies, and then try to run the whole thing. So, so this is more fun, and this afternoon is even better. OK, any other questions? Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, Nick's already showed me. I, I don't know anything about um, the technology that you're using. 
Yeah, uh, your, your, your answers to us about Aurora in your country. So thank you. We've already got our database. It's, it's really neat uh, this afternoon. So we'll try to encourage you, all of you, uh, to just give us your flavor of what the Aurora is in, in, in your culture, your uh, kind of home. How many of you in your country have never, ever seen an Aurora? Yeah, there are, there, there are places that won't hardly ever. Uh, Nick, we're done. <laughs>